So, Brian, let's, let's turn our attention to some decision-making around a case in second-line therapy. So why don't you describe the 64-year-old male, and then we'll entertain some questions around second-line sure. therapy. Sure. So this is a, a 64-year-old male who, uh, in 2000, had undergone a, a left radical nephrectomy for clear cell kidney cancer. This is before I met him. Um, many years later, nine years later, just to illustrate some of the long natural history of this disease, he had recurrent lung nodules. Uh, they were probably present on scans, eventually grew, got biopsied, and was consistent with recurrent disease. Um, he was actually initially observed due to his low volume disease, and he really uh, uh, desired, was a very active working gentleman and desired to avoid any sort of toxicity, so we observed him for a while. Um, he had continued, continued indolent growth and then finally developed some new lymph nodes, uh, paratrachea lesion, and so the, there was an impetus to start his systemic therapy. It was about 2011. We, uh, at the time, started uh, sunitinib 50 milligrams, four weeks on, two weeks off. Had initial partial response to sunitinib and then eventually developed uh, progressive disease with new lesions after a total of about 14 months of therapy. So a pretty nice re initial response to sunitinib, and again, in the context of somebody with fairly indolent disease. Um, as I mentioned, we tend to use axitinib um, second line. We started him at a standard dose of five milligrams twice daily. And then something that I think we can talk about at the time, we empirically escalated him after four weeks to seven milligrams um, BID, which is how the trials were written. And if you look in the label, that's kind of um, how the titration is currently is five to seven to 10 based on um, clinical criteria. Um, and actually, he has a, an ongoing partial response at seven milligrams. We weren't able to titrate him further. Yeah, so I mean, it's a great case for a number of reasons. First, um, and we see so many of these patients, this patient had a nine-year disease-free interval between nephrectomy and recurrence. And that, that in and of itself is, is a defining biologic indicator. And, and I think we would all agree that we encourage our, our viewing audience to, when looking at the literature, is to see how many patients had disease that was in proximate to the presentation of their primary tumor and how many in the distant past. But Brian, I, I, want, I want you to elaborate on uh, the, the, what you've led, which is following patients with known metastatic disease that's relatively indolent and that may not need initial therapy for some period of time. So the questions are, who are those patients? How do you identify them? And then most importantly, because you're watching their scans every three months or so, how do you decide to pull the trigger and do something? Right. So we, um, about four or five years ago, recognizing that this happens in clinical practice, started a prospective trial. Um, and we recruited about 50 patients, um, Cleveland Clinic and some other centers, looking at when there was a clinical decision to follow the patient, not retrospectively, um, but to follow the patient prospectively such as this. Nine-year disease-free interval, small lung nodules, but we don't think they need immediate treatment. Um, and those patients, there was eligibility for the trial, of course, but they were, again, largely sort of clinically selected as we all would in our practice, where you sort of know it when you see it. Um, we actually just um, are putting the data together for ASCO submission, so I can't sort of give you full details, but I can tell you the average time we watched people was well over a year. Now this is not, this is maybe five to 10% of kidney cancer. Um, you know, so it's not probably the average patient that walks in, but it's not a, a, an insignificant minority either. It's, it's a, a reasonable number of patients. Um, and then they went on to systemic therapy and of course did great on systemic therapy because they have indolent disease. So these patients are just gonna do well. What I tell patients is that there was usually a few triggers that make me wanna start therapy. Um, so one of them would be an increased pace of disease. You're watching them and they're growing slowly and suddenly their pace increases. Uh, new sites of disease, new organ sites of disease would be a trigger. Um, symptoms from disease, which I don't think happened in any patient as you might imagine, or doctor or patient anxiety, if either mm -hmm. of us got nervous, and that never happened either. One of the things we found in this experience is patients love not being treated. We thought it would be difficult to get people to observe metastatic disease and most people were relieved that they didn't need treatment and actually um, we didn't have anybody withdraw consent. I'm not sure we had anybody even turn down the trial. So patients, I think, on, when you sort of explain the non-curative and potentially toxic nature of therapy, and I usually tell them that I love treating kidney cancer, but I just don't think they need it now, uh, it's sort of a relief. Um, and so, so we've had a, a fair amount of success, and we'll, we'll hopefully report the data soon.